Greetings, I'm Bill Mobley, Chair of the Department of Neurosciences here at UCSD, and you're plugged into Neurosciences Connections. Uh, in this uh, short uh, interview, I'm going to be talking with Ron Ellis, who's a professor of uh, neurosciences here at our university, and whose work in HIV neurology has been not just cutting edge, but really at the very forefront of those efforts to understand this illness and its impact on the nervous system. So, Ron, it's great to have you with us, and uh, please uh, tell our uh, viewers about you, about your career, and about what you're up to. Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, I've uh, been a neurologist now for more than 20 years, uh, originally trained actually in behavioral neurology, mm -hmm. uh, but became uh, interested in the HIV epidemic, even as an intern, uh, where at a point in time when it was a very devastating illness mm -hmm. and we were seeing lots of young people w who were dying of opportunistic infections and so forth. Uh, uh, I have actually been witness to uh, major advances in the uh, treatment of the disease. And uh, so the good news is that we have uh, very effective tools for treating uh, HIV infection uh, systemically. Uh, and uh, we have uh, been looking at how their impact on the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system as well. Uh, the bad news is that uh, unfortunately uh, although we can get a lot of improvement uh, mm -hmm. with these antiretroviral treatments, we haven't abolished HIV mm -hmm. neurologic disease. Uh, it continues even in people who have um, well-suppressed viral loads and mm -hmm. have restored some immunity. So at, at this point, we've uh, taken a disease that was uh, a severe, acute, morbid, and mortal disease and transformed it into a chronic disease. Uh, that requires ongoing management. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge now. I suppose it, it's just the case that the problems that one faced when it was an acute disease are really different in magnitude and type than, than the problems we're now facing with, uh, with chronic infection. They are. They're very different kinds of problems. Uh, they tend not to lead to hospitalizations, but instead to uh, reduce the quality of life of people mm -hmm. who have uh, HIV over the now many years of their li lifespan that they can anticipate uh, taking these very effective therapies. So talk a little bit more about a person who's, uh, who's suffering the chronic uh, effects of HIV infection. How has their life changed? Well, um, the two most common uh, conditions that we see are a mild degree of cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. uh, in many ways similar to what happens uh, prior to Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. so-called mild cognitive impairment, uh, but also uh, peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we've seen that uh, um, although we've got drugs now that don't cause neuropathy, uh, the neuropathy that people developed either from HIV itself or uh, from uh, older drugs that they took that may have uh, exacerbated their neuropathy, uh, uh, that neuropathy persists. Oh, I see. And uh, so in addition to maybe n not being as sharp as they uh, could, not being able to go back to the same level of employment that they once mm -hmm. uh, had, uh, they're dogged by pain and mm -hmm. uh, uncomfortable sensations in the feet mm -hmm. that frequently limit their ability to um, get around and do the things they need to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. uh, they may become less active and suffer complications as a mm -hmm. result of uh, uh, loss of physical conditioning, mm -hmm. uh, so loss of mental and physical conditioning, I mm -hmm. think, is uh, is what we're talking about over long periods mm -hmm. of time. So that must be a real burden for them, and I'm sure they, uh, you you see these folks, and I'm sure they have lots of complaints about uh, about these issues. They do, um, uh, to a variable degree. Uh, um, people report, uh, as I as I mentioned, that they can't. Um, they're not as sharp, as sharp as they used to be. They can't uh, perform the same job functions. They mm -hmm. have to ask for help for other people uh, mm -hmm. frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, things that to you or I seem uh, straightforward and simple, like uh, figuring out how to get from point A to point B, mm -hmm. uh, uh, using the public trans transit or learning a, 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 a how to travel to a new location can be a real uh, mm -hmm. issue for them. Um, it's also a significant impact uh, the cognitive uh, problems, that is, 
on their ability to take their medications. Mm. Uh, very often these are complex uh, medication schedules. Uh, certain pills need to be taken uh, at certain times of day, within uh, before or after meals, avoiding uh, conflicts with other medications they may be taking. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they don't do it correctly, the, the, uh, the outcome is they'll, uh, uh, the possible development of resistance mm -hmm. of their virus and mm -hmm. the need to change medications. Mm -hmm. So these are all really important things. Yeah, that, that a real dilemma for them. What, what are you up to? What's, what's happening now to make this problem less severe? Well, one of our major um, initiatives has been to champion the idea that if you're going to treat the nervous system, you need to get the medications to the nervous Makes system. Makes sense, sure. Um, most people are familiar with the concept of, of a blood-brain barrier, a blood CSF barrier. These are anatomical and physiological uh, 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 components that protect the brain on the one hand, uh, but on the other hand, can prevent drugs that are beneficial from getting there. Mm -hmm. And in the case of anti-HIV medicines, uh, many of those drugs don't reach uh, the target tissue in the brain as mm -hmm. well as they do other tissues. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, ways to characterize the amount of drug that does reach the nervous system, uh, uh, find the drugs that do the best job there, and design therapies for people who do have these cognitive problems that, uh, that uh, would more effectively uh, reach the nervous system. That's great. So are you able to, to benefit from uh, the work in Alzheimer's disease and helping with cognitive problems? Has that been a, has been a translation between those two different disorders yet? It's a good question. Um, I think a lot of the background uh, in terms of the uh, measures of cognition that were developed in the Alzheimer's uh, field have uh, been borrowed mm -hmm. uh, and uh, applied to this new condition. As it turns out, uh, they don't work as well mm -hmm. uh, in HIV as they do in Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, that's largely because the areas of the brain and the way in which the brain is affected by HIV is rather different mm -hmm. than uh, with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but um, neuropsychologists and other scientists who work with these uh, behavioral measures have uh, come up with very good, relatively efficient ways of both screening for and monitoring mm -hmm. uh, people's progress on treatment. Uh, and we are actively using uh, those techniques. Sounds like that's a big part of what you, you're doing. It is. Uh, clinical evaluations are very important. Uh, we do uh, have a great deal of interest in biomarkers, uh, both uh, 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 molecules that we can measure in spinal fluid or in mm -hmm. blood, like mm -hmm. chemokines and cytokines, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but also in neuroimaging measures. Uh, so, for example, uh, my colleagues are working with things like diffusion tensor imaging, with uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance uh, imaging, uh, to try and come up with ways to uh, uh, see the signal that results from our uh, clinical interventions mm -hmm. uh, and give us the best readout uh, for uh, efficacy. Now you mentioned chemokines. Is inflammation uh, a big part of what we're con dealing with with the chronic uh, condition? It is uh, and um, so inflammation as it turns out is uh, is routine in HIV infection and it doesn't go away when mm. the even when the disease is effectively treated. Um, it's not widely known, uh, but one of the most significant effects of uh, HIV infection is that it depletes uh, uh, CD4 cells in the gut. These are cells that prevent bacterial products in the gut from making their way into the bloodstream. Uh, and because they're lost mm -hmm. in HIV, uh, mm -hmm. there's a continuing onslaught of what's something called endotoxin and other ba bacterial products that produce inflammation mm. even when the viral load has been driven to undetectable mm. and the peripheral blood CD4 count has been restored. Uh, and that inflammation appears to be associated with a no number of other downstream negative effects including vascular disease mm -hmm. and even metabolic disorders uh, like hyperlipidemia, uh, glucose intolerance and so forth. So it's fascinating. So these folks as a result of the treatment of the acute disease 
have now are now predisposed to, to, to essentially see these endotoxins toxins that come from the gut and to have the consequences of really intoxication, if you will, from those products. That's right. So that seems like a very important problem. And what's happening on that front? Are there, are there thoughts about how to deal with that problem? Um, there are many thoughts. It's still very early in the area. Uh, it was only really recognized uh, the, the importance of this uh, within the past five to 10 years. Uh, as uh, effective therapies became available, uh, uh, we began to recognize that patients with HIV infection were now dying from things other than mm -hmm. uh, your typical AIDS-associated illnesses. Uh, they were dying of heart attacks mm -hmm. and liver disease and, mm -hmm. and uh, other problems uh, and stroke. So um, we've just really begun our work in this area. Mm -hmm. We haven't identified the key sort of pathways that need to be uh, mm -hmm. where interventions need, need to occur, uh, but we're actively working Sounds on. like an important new area for research and uh, one could imagine a number of approaches, but uh, obviously that must... Uh, that has to be a very high priority for HIV neurologists. It is, it's a very high priority and um, as you can imagine, it's a very multidisciplinary area. Uh, UCSD turns out to be a uniquely uh, excellent place to do this kind of work because we have uh, expertise in so many different areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we have excellent neuroimaging, we have excellent pharmacology, uh, we have good infectious disease people, and we have our neurosciences uh, uh, background. And putting all those things together uh, just uh, uh, really makes for uh, an excellent uh, cutting edge uh, way to approach Sounds these great. kinds of problems. Obviously, this is a necessary uh, condition to, to making a difference in a complex disorder like chronic HIV infection. That's right, but we're hoping that uh, the, what comes out of it will benefit not only HIV patients, but mm -hmm. perhaps people with other conditions that are chronic and involve in, inflammation. What, maybe mention what you think there. I mean, what other conditions do you think might be affected? Well, we, we know that uh, inflammation is a component of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's uh, upregulation of a variety of inflammatory pathways, and mm -hmm. there are micro activated microglial cells in the brains of people with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, it's believed to be play a role perhaps in Parkinson's disease as well. Uh, and then, of course, there are many uh, uh, chronic viral infections uh, not so much in the United States, but in, uh, in the developing world, uh, where uh, the lessons we learned from HIV may be applicable to those conditions as well. And that's really a part of biological sciences, isn't it? When you get into a disorder, you find out that what you're learning about, let's say HIV, is really having an impact more generally on the way people think about uh, brain illnesses. And uh, that's one of the big payoffs of really spending so much time and energy on this disorder. Uh, Maybe there will be something for the, for the Alzheimer's patient or the frontotemporal dementia patient that uh, will change the game because of work that you're doing. Yes, I, I would agree with that. I think uh, it's very important for there to be a lot of crosstalk between different areas. Um, and many of the best ideas that we've had came from other fields. Mm -hmm. We expect to be able to deliver the same to those other fields. Sounds exciting. Ron, thank you for being here. Certainly Take welcome. Care.